Welcome to Sunrise Life, the podcast where we have deep conversations with fellow freelance models. Today, I have Taylor White on the show. Hi, Taylor. Hey, I'm super happy to be here. Thank you for having me. Yeah, thanks for contacting me. I I love it when people reach out because they found out about the podcast and want to be a part of it. Yeah, I like how you're branching out more over the years. It's like more encompassing. I think that's really cool. Thank you. Yeah, I'm hoping that this podcast sticks and like gets popular. So if you're listening, share it with your friends. (laughs) Share it with everybody. For our listeners, can you describe how you got into modeling and the progress of your modeling career and where you are now? Yeah, for sure. So I've been modeling for about nine and a half, almost 10 years. I started when I was 16 I had, before drop shipping existed, I had a buy and resale fashion store, mainly wholesaling for pre-orders. So I, instead of using stock images, would test out the clothing myself before I would put it on my site and have a professional photographer take images of me in it and then use that for advertising because it seemed that the client base and customers were more interested in actually seeing that rather than a stock photo of the image. After like a year and a half of doing that, I had an entire fashion and swimwear portfolio. And somebody told me about Model Mayhem. And I went ahead and made an account. And for the first, I'd say, two to three years, I was only traveling and shooting within Florida. And then when I was 19, I started doing tours outside of the state. So you started doing fashion and swimwear because you were selling clothing. Tell me more about that. So drop shipping has made this, it's not lucrative anymore, which is why I stopped doing it. But essentially just like drop shipping, except it's not being shipped from the manufacturer directly. I was ordering items at a discounted rate in bulk and then taking pictures of my own of them. Everything from hats, purses, belts, swimwear, dresses, the whole nine yards and selling it for less than the store sells it for, but obviously markup from what I was getting it from. Oh, that is clever. I was probably making about 50 to 75% of the overall total on each item. Nice. Um, But I was selling it for less than half of what a retailer was selling it for. That's really cool. And are are you doing modeling full-time now? I've been doing modeling full-time for the past seven years. And then at the time that you were doing the the drop shipping, was that your full-time gig? It was. That was what I was doing full-time. And then I was only taking occasional bookings around the state of Florida. I'm sure other models, Florida Florida sucks for bookings. Yeah. Um. (laughs) Yeah, it does. (laughs) Florida sucks. Nobody wants to pay. Um, and you got to go up and down. You got to go up and down the entire state. Um, so once I started touring, I, it started to get easier. But I would say I probably didn't start doing like I was touring a lot, but I probably wasn't starting to actually see a decent turnaround until I was about 21. Is when things started to get better. Nice. So you've been freelancing for even longer than you've been a full-time model. That's cool. Yeah, I've been freelancing my entire life. I've taken up, you know, weird entry-level positions here and there when things have gotten hard. But other than that, I've been modeling and doing um, wholesale drop shipping my entire life. And do you mind if I ask how old you are now? I'm um, 25. Cool. Oh, that's so awesome. Oh, man. I mean... I didn't, I didn't get sober until I was 24, but leading up until then, I was just kind of screwing around massively. So when I hear of people who are like around that age, who are, have been kicking ass, like since their teens, I'm, I'm really inspired. Thank you. I mean, I'm inspired by your story as well. And you know, <laughs> life, life has ups and downs, you know, not everything's always going great. You know, life isn't an Instagram reel. Totally. But- if you just keep trying, you know, it's like a computer when you think about it. You can put in a thousand no's, but if you put in 2,000 yeses, the yes is going to win over the no. And if you don't ask, you never get an answer. The worst thing somebody can say to you is no. Yeah, I like that. I totally agree. 
So you started modeling when you were 16, like, and that was for your drop shipping business? Yep. That's cool. Wow. Did you, were you still living with your folks or had you already moved out? I was emancipated at 16. Oh my goodness. Wow. So unfortunately I've been paying bills for (laughs) a long time, but yeah, I've been doing things on my own. I've had assistance, you know, I haven't been all by myself, but I've had all by myself since 16 pretty much. Wow. I'm sorry you had to get emancipated, but I'm glad that that is an option for people. It's way harder than people think to get emancipated. Um, You have to show that you can financially support yourself. So when I was 16, I had to get an LLC for my business. And I, my, I was adopted by my grandparents and they didn't want me to get emancipated. So they didn't want to sign off on the paperwork for the LLC because I couldn't do it by myself. So I had to have uh, basically a step in legal guardian that was appointed by the courts to sign it. That then I was able to show provable income, and it's extremely difficult to get an apartment. I can imagine. I remember when I was 16, I wanted to get emancipated. Not, I wasn't like being abused by my parents, but they were divorced and like always having kind of power struggles with each other over what to do with us kids. But I, I didn't, wasn't able to go through that paperwork process, so I, I didn't have like enough evidence to show the need to be emancipated but I did get my first job when I was 16 but but that's that's amazing that you were able to do that and now in your freelance modeling are are you doing like artistic news and things like that like what types of images now are, are your main sources of income so I do a really wide range like all of us do from like fashion all the way up to fine art nude my favorite is outdoor nature nudes I would say recently, you know, I've been doing a lot of glam in studio and pinup as of the past two months. I'm trying to get back outside again now. Yeah. And is that a lot of that in Florida, the glamour and the pinup and stuff? No, I did a lot of it actually in California. Surprisingly. Oh, cool. Yeah. I've, when I moved down to Southern California way back in like 2014, that's when I started doing a lot of glamour. And I think that the hardest thing about wanting to do like more artistic nude and nature stuff is that if you have a lot of glamour, like posted of you around the internet, then some artistic nude photographers like don't want to work with you. And it seems like, uh, kind of like they want to put you in the box of glamour. Have you experienced that? Yeah, so I have a very, very large fine art nature nude portfolio that I've been building for probably about four and a half years. And um, for about two, three years, I was mainly advertising myself, even though I was taking all forms of work as a fine art nature nude model. What started to happen was, you know, when I'm going out to these places, I'm probably only doing that twice a month, maybe three times a month, unless I'm going to go out on my own. Yeah. I'm running out of content. And I'm like, well, you know, now I'm not posting. Now I'm not showing relevance, you know. So I used to only post fine art nature nude work. But now I've come to the point where I just post everything I do. I've got fine art nature nude next to pen up next to glamour. Because I used to care so much about social media, analytics, all of that. And I was very, very in-depth in it. And what I realized was it wasn't really getting me that many bookings. So yeah. I kind of was, I was kind of just like, I'm just going to do whatever I want. I don't care anymore. <laughs> That's good. It, I think it's good to have that realization because for a long time, I also felt like I wanted to be perceived in a certain way, but like people on the internet are going to perceive you in whatever way, you know, suits them, not the way mm-hmm. that you necessarily want to be perceived, even if you are curating your image So, so yeah, like, I think that not having a niche is okay. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, I, I have my niche. I just, you know, I try to, well, I have things that I'm specifically very good at, Yeah, but I, I try to just, you know, post all recent work. Also what was happening was, so I used to be for most of my modeling career up until the age of about 22, 23, 
um, I was 110 pounds, not because I was starving myself or anything, but just because I was a really late bloomer. I didn't believe in second puberty until it happened to me. And then when I hit about 23, I started gaining weight and not in a bad way whatsoever, but I was so thin. And so I started losing bookings and people were straight up telling me like, you no longer fit my image. You have gained a decent amount of weight because now I'm like 135 pounds. And uh, they're like, I don't want to work with you anymore. So I had to completely rebrand myself. Now I make more money actually than I was then and get more bookings, but I had to start from scratch. And the the reason that I started doing a lot more of showing everything also is because I always want a recent updated image. I don't want somebody having me show up and be like looking at a picture from 2017 and be like, you don't look like that. Yeah, definitely. When you change your look, I just, I just shaved my head and I'm kind of going through like psychologically, like, oh, are people not going to work with, want to work with me anymore because I look completely different than before. So yeah, the rebrand, if you can like reach the audience that likes and is drawn to the aesthetic that you are at your, your current, then that's the way to go. But you're right. Like, if you had already built a fan base up with your previous look, was it like, how, how did you go about doing that? What, what was your method of rebranding, if you don't mind me asking? So mine was, uh, it was a little brutal, but I didn't want to waste any time about it. I, uh, I posted a picture of what I looked like in 2019 next to a picture of what I looked like in 2022. And I put it out there and I said, uh, don't spread hate, words hurt. If you like the picture on the left more than the picture on the right, that's perfectly fine. Don't book me. If you do want to book me, you can book me here. And I put a link. And then wow. I just start, and then I just started posting all of my recent work, doing a lot more behind the scenes content, a lot more interactive, engaging content rather than just a solid photo. Yeah. And it, it, it works. You know, when when you lead with honesty, in my opinion, with my own experience, it's never a bad thing. I don't like going back and forth over semantics. I don't want to have, you know, anybody mad at me, but I also don't want to sit here and have like someone bashing on me because of my weight because they thought I looked different. So I just was very cut and dry about it. This is what it is. If you don't like it, that's fine. If you do, here it is. That's awesome. I'm sure you had to block some assholes, but I mean, you don't let the door hit them on their way out, right? (laughs) Actually, I really didn't have much negative feedback. Most of it was positive. Oh, great. That's awesome. Yeah, I was surprised. That's very good. Yeah, I guess if you embrace with honesty with your audience, like, all right, this is my look now instead of trying to hide it or like only post severely photoshopped images, you know, that, that would be the wrong way to go about it, you know, is trying to like hide what you look like when, when you're a nude model, one of the greatest things I think about like the nude modeling industry is that it's so fluid as far as like what you can do with your lines and shapes. Yeah, there's such a variety out there. And I think it's awesome, really, some of the things that I've seen, especially with the bodyscapes and outdoor nudes. Because, you know, just like with the shapes of nature, you can find something for every body type. And it does seem, there's definitely like some photographers who only book like the very thin body type. But I find that people who have that narrow of an idea of what they can create art with aren't necessarily like the nice personality type photographers out there. They seem to usually be more like the kind of misogynistic ones. Yeah, no, I have, and I understand where they're coming from. I've had quite a few fine art news photographers tell me like with what I want to do, I need you to have like rock hard abs and like no butt and no boobs and you don't fit it. And I'm like, that's fine. Just don't book me then. You don't got to tell me about why. Just say no, you know? like Right. Just say no. Yeah. I'll leave you alone. And I honestly, I think that that comes down to just not being willing or able to move outside of their own comfort zone when it comes to what kind of lighting and what kind of angles they want to shoot at. 
Because a lot of people really honestly just shoot the same type of thing over and over with different models. Mm -hmm. I agree with that. And I think that it's also just they don't want to leave their comfort zone because they don't want to pay somebody. This is my opinion. They don't want to pay somebody and then it'd be experimental and not receive a good outcome. So they know that this works for them. So they just keep doing it. Yeah. And it just ends up like a lot of this model photography stuff does kind of sort of blend together. So it is refreshing to see somebody who's kind of embraced their true selves and gone outside of the box to create different types of imagery. And I, and I always look, when I see that, it, it is inspiring because not, not everybody fits the cookie cutter mold. And mm -hmm. I think that when I see images that are like showing scars or aging or like curvy body types, like I like that because nobody's perfect. And when you show like diversity then it it just seems more of a positive community than this kind of elitist sort of everybody looks the same type thing yeah what i think is crazy though is like so i am five seven and i weigh 135 pounds i did a belt catalog ad recently they put me in the plus size section i wasn't mad at it because they were paying me really well i don't care where they put me in all honesty but they were just like, we're going to put you in the plus size division. I'm like, are you serious? Really? And they were just like, yeah. I was like, okay, whatever you want. I mean, plus size. I've talked to other plus size models in the past about this, actually. And I don't know what the current, like, standards are for plus size. But I've heard that there's like a range of plus size that's ideal for fashion catalogs that they try to select from. And if you're like more than the, you know, zero size gene, but like less than a certain size, then you're still, the in-between is harder to book when it comes to fashion. But like the, I don't know what the standard sizing for plus size is, but I think, is it like I have no idea. eight to 12? I, Tell me if I'm wrong. I have no idea because I wear depending on the brand a wide range a two to a six so oh, okay. i have no idea like that doesn't seem plus just, size honestly no it doesn't <laughs> it doesn't seem plus size at all which is why when she told me that i was just like so like out of it i was like i mean if that's what you want you know you're the one signing my check but I think uh, when those are published, they're going to be published next year. I think that there's going to be some backlash on the company. <laughs> because, was that uh, a recent shoot? Uh, what did I do? I think it was when I was in New York City, which was in, when was that? October of last year. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I've When I first started modeling, I wanted to be a petite fashion runway model. And mm -hmm. I sought out runway and I came to learn real quick that that was not going to happen. But I think a lot of models, when they first get into modeling, they think that they need to be in fashion magazines and doing runway. It, and yeah. you've done, you've done some fashion modeling recently. What, what other fashion modeling besides the company that you did with the drop shipping have you done? I've only done the stuff with the drop shipping and working with Belk. I've worked with them multiple times uh, over the years. I've worked with them about three times now. And what's awesome about catalog modeling is if, is if they like you and you have an in, it's all about knowing somebody. And if, yeah. you have, if you have an in, what they told me was they were like, it doesn't matter if you age or you gain weight or you lose weight. We'll just keep putting you in different categories. That's cool. So they're like, oh, you could be 40. All right, now you're in the mature women's section. Okay, you lost weight. Now we can put you in juniors. You gain weight. Okay, you go here. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. I actually, that's, that's the first time I've heard that. I've always perceived the fashion industry to just be like really strict and unforgiving. Well, this isn't fashion. It's, it is fashion, but it's catalog work. It's different gotcha. than me working oh, okay. with a designer. You know what I mean? Catalog work has a lot more leniency. Right. Gotcha. That makes sense. That does make sense. I've, I did some like indie stuff, but I guess more of my stuff now is just like nude slash artistic. 
And they don't care about nudity either. Oh, that's cool. That's good. It sounds like a sounds like a good company, even though they put are putting you in a plus size and though you don't necessarily fit that like definition, I suppose. <laughs> I am yeah. gonna be curious. We have to stay in touch and you let me know when that comes out. I'll send you I'll send you pictures of it. It's a. Uh, it'll be okay. um they're gonna send me an actual physical copy of the catalog. You know, like back to school stuff or even like summer, yeah. fall, whatever, when they make the catalog. Yeah, yeah. We did it for 20, 2024. They usually shoot about a year in advance. But yeah, I mean, they're good people to work for, honestly. They're nice. They're on time. I didn't have any hostility while on set. They fed me. That's awesome. Yep, they brought me Chipotle. <laughs> oh, nice. That is ideal. I love it when they bring food. <laughs> Yeah, more models uh, should start looking in the catalog work for more work stability because honestly, to support yourself, you only need to work it twice a year. Really? Yeah, and it's. I'm not saying that's the only thing you have to do all year. I'm just saying that that will set you up to have a decent baseline. Catalog work is not high-end fashion work. You're not working with designers. You're not doing any of that. It's pretty relaxed. I mean, you got to do a lot of outfits. You're working a 12-hour day. And you're doing a lot of different stuff, but I mean, it's, it's definitely worth it. If you can, if you know somebody, it's really all about word of mouth because most of these people are hiring from an agency. Yeah. But if you know one of the staff photographers or editors that shoots for them and they refer you, then it's cheaper for them because they don't have to pay an agency fee and you get more because you're not working with an agency and having an agency fee taken out of your pay. That's good advice. Maybe I'll try. You would be a perfect candidate for it. Oh, yeah. You would be great for it. <laughs> you think it. so? Yeah. Yeah. I'm five foot two. I mean, I, I don't know if that really makes a difference with catalog, but most pants are too long for me. They'll just put you in the women's petite section. I would be down. <laughs> I yeah. would be down. I haven't sought that out because of the rejections that I had when I was in my late teens. Yeah, no, I actually took, unfortunately, I had to take a temporary position as a Macy's manager during season because I didn't want to travel because every time I travel during the holidays, something bad happens. So this year I was like, I'm not doing it. And I mean, I'm do I was working with Belk, not Macy's, but at Macy's, the department for it, they have an entire petite section. Huge. Well, it's definitely something that I'll look into as I travel. They usually base it out of New York is usually where the company shoot it. I will be there in June. I'm definitely cool. look into it. All right. Thank you. Well, it's good to hear about your good experiences that you've had and the way that you've set up your career. But I'd like to ask you if you've ever had any kind of crazy photo shoot experiences. This segment of the podcast, I like to call the photo shoot fail of the week can you describe a time that you had a photo shoot that like either didn't go as planned or the scenario was fucked up or the photographer themselves was out of line so this one is probably emotionally the worst one i've had thank god that because of the way i present myself i have not had any a lot of sexual lies encounters with people but this man, so I was on a cross country tour from Melbourne, Florida, all the way to Phoenix, Arizona and back going through all of the states with my friend and photographer who has now passed Robert Robichaud. And we were in Los Angeles and I had a photo. We had just came from New Mexico and we drove through the entire night. We hadn't taken any breaks just to get to this photo shoot on time. We were on time. The guy gave us some proper instructions and we had to find parking. Because of that, I was 10 minutes late and I was on the phone with him the entire time. When I walked up, I had my bag and everything. When I walked up to the building while Bob was parking the car, I had forgotten my mask in the car. So I go, I'm just going to, I'm sorry about that. If there's a mask policy, I'm just going to run back and get it real quick. I don't have one on me. It's in the car. He slams the door in my face. It's a glass door. He slams the door in my face face tells me he's not paying me and he doesn't want to shoot anymore and for me to go fuck myself <gasps> he is what? sitting there with the door closed i've got my bag I'm, i started crying 
I started crying because I was just like, I just came all the way from New Mexico, dude. This was a four hour or three hour dance studio shoot in LA. He had booked a studio for, so he paid money. And I'm just standing here like, I don't, what did I do? Like, I don't understand what the problem is. So I'm crying. He's just sitting there uh, on the other side of the glass door, just staring at me. I'm like throwing my hands up in the air. Like, what the fuck? I keep looking back at him. I'm just like, I, I guess I'm leaving then. I go back to the car. I'm crying in the car with Bob. I text him. He sends me half of the photo shoot money because I worded it in a professional manner, putting it on him because it is his fault. So he sent me half of the photo shoot money. And essentially, I can't remember what he said word for word, but he said something along the lines of like, it just seems like you're having a really stressful, hard day and this isn't going to work. I'm sorry I overreacted. I can't do this right now. Well, I'm, I'm sure your day was going fine until he slammed the door on you and told you to fuck yourself. Jesus. <laughs> I don't understand. I have no idea what I did. I have, I mean, I was a little frazzled because we were trying to find parking and we had been driving a really long way, but I wasn't being disrespectful or like uh, unprofessional in any way. Oh my God. And I was just like, what the hell, dude? I was like, I just drove like over a thousand miles to get here. I would be very upset too. That's, was, that's so yeah. mean. Oh, super mean. What an asshole. I can't I believe that. <laughs> so, so he he sent you, he should have sent you 100% of your payment, first of all. <laughs> he should have, but he wouldn't. I, I hope that he felt bad about being so mean. I wonder if that was, I wonder if his guilt was anything that encouraged him to send you at least 50% of the payment. That's I'm, pre- I'm pretty sure that that's why he sent half of the money was because he felt bad. But what I think was happening, so I've been in a lot of abusive situations throughout my life. He can't handle stress. Is basically the only thing I can gather from that. It was a stressful situation. It would not have been difficult to resolve. I was in the process of resolving it. He couldn't handle it. He freaked the fuck out and made it worse. Yeah, because I guess he doesn't know how to manage his emotions as a full-grown middle-aged man. But okay, yeah, he made my life hell. If Bob wasn't there, I would have been fucked. Damn, it sounds like yeah. um, I've I've actually I've kind of psychoanalyzed some situations like this where I'm trying to figure out why people acted the way that they did, and what I've learned is that some people react to stressing or triggering like scenarios either with a a fight flight freeze or fawn and it sounds like Mm -hmm. his uh way of reacting is uh the fight response where there's like aggression towards the the person who is you know triggering the stress so slamming the door in your face and telling you to go fuck yourself might have been his uh fight response and i guess that's the only way that i can analyze why he would do something like that yeah i mean i agree with you there's nothing else i could understand obviously this person has not been put through many stressful situations in their life because that is yeah. not the response you do and then so <laughs> This is unrelated. This is a tour thing, but this is unrelated to a photographer. This actually just happened to me in Chicago. Oh, tell me. My flight, they kept switch on St. Patrick's Day. I flew out to Chicago and the airport is crazy because it's St. Patrick's Day and everybody is drunk, getting drunk in the terminal. They kept switching my gates. They, they delayed my flight and then they switched my gates like four or five times and I missed my flight because they kept switching gates and I'm getting it through email. And they're like, nope, it's this date. Nope, it's this date. So I go up to the counter and of course I'm flying spirit. I go up to the, I go up to the counter and they're like, okay, I can't get you on a flight till tomorrow for free. I'm like, no, that's not going to work. And they're like, well, why didn't you hear me calling in the terminal? It's your fault. I'm like, no, you gave me like four different gate numbers. She's like, well, then you're just going to have to book with another airline. So I drop another $300 for a last minute flight on United to get to Chicago. I was supposed to be there at 3 p.m. I get there at 11 p.m. I take an Uber to my Airbnb, which I'm supposed to be shooting out of. I get there. 
I asked the Uber to watch me while I go up to the lockbox. There's no fucking key in the lockbox. The lady oh. owns like the the lady owns like 15 Airbnb properties, so everything is being managed by other people. She only responds to calls and messages, and she doesn't live anywhere close. I'm calling her. I ask her. I had to go to a nearby dive bar to charge my phone because it's dying. Oh my god. I have all my luggage with me. It is cold as shit outside for 10 degrees. I'm freezing. Oh my I, have all my, I have all my luggage with me. It's St. Patrick's Day. I have all my luggage with me. I sit it down in the dive bar. I'm like, I need a drink now. The, um, the, the bar owner comes over to me. This is like a local bar. Everybody here comes here all the time. He comes over to me. He shows me his ID. He's like, you are in distress, correct? I'm like, yes. Shows me his ID. He's like, this is my wife. That is my son. I will help you. I will. Here, here is a beer. Then I'm going to put you in my car. We're going to go to the Airbnb together so you don't get locked out outside in the cold. I'm like, okay. So I get in his car. We go back to the Airbnb. The lady gives me a second drop uh, lockbox key code. I get the key. I'm like, will you come up with me? Because I don't know what I'm walking into right now. He goes, yes. We go up to the Airbnb. There is a literal crackhead. With crack on the table, sleeping in my Airbnb. Oh my fucking god! Are you serious? I'm pretty oh. sure I have a picture of him. I'm pretty sure he was ODing because we tried to wake him up and he would not wake up. And so the lady tells me she's like, "You're gonna have to get a hotel for the night. I can't do anything about it. I'll refund it for one night, and I'll put you up in a different one of my Airbnbs tomorrow." Then she says, "Still, I can't check in until 3 p.m. the next day." Oh my god. So what this good Samaritan this good it's not done yet. This this good Samaritan bar owner buys me a hotel. I mean it's a super shitty hotel, but I don't care. He gets me a hotel room. I had to call all of my shoots. I didn't cancel anything and reschedule everything. I was able to get them all in, but because one of them was supposed to be from nine to one at my Airbnb and I couldn't get until three. I lost two yeah. hours of shoot time. And so I had to fight with Airbnb to get me my money back. And I was refunded for the entire stay. But when I woke up the next morning in the next Airbnb I'm in, there's a giant water leak above the toilet. God. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Chicago. It's Chicago, right? Yeah, Chicago. But what I will say, I mean, that Airbnb lady is awful. She should not be allowed to have Airbnbs. She should be taken off of the platform. But everybody in Chicago was some of the nicest people I've met, honestly. That's good. They, The people were super, super helpful. But that Airbnb lady and that car kid. <laughs> that is crazy. I'm glad that you had that bar owner guy that was just nice enough to walk you up there because what the fuck? I know. And he's sitting there yelling at him. I'm yelling at him. I'm like, is he dead? And then we're like checking his pulse. I'm like, he's not dead. Oh my God. That's insane. I wonder how he got in there. He was a previous guest. So this is actually a scam. And I understand why they're doing it in Chicago because I wouldn't want to be homeless there. It's cold as shit. They get an Airbnb for one night and then they don't leave. But so what he did was he did get kicked out. She didn't change the lockbox code. So because I didn't check in at three and instead of, and I got checked in at 11, he went back after the cleaning crew had came through, got the lockbox key and went back up. Oh, damn. It's happening across the entire country. Oh my God. That's see the hard, people don't know these things about being a traveling freelance model is that sometimes you have to deal with that kind of shit. <laughs> I would say honestly, I never for the most part feel unsafe in, when I'm doing photo shoots. I feel unsafe when I'm traveling from place to place. Yes. Yes, I've had definitely some sketchy Greyhound and Amtrak ride experiences oh, yeah. and sketchy Uber rides um, where I'm like, dang. I'm, and then you hear stories about people getting like, you know, kidnapped and drugged and stuff while they're like on tour or whatever. And so you're always kind of on your toes. And yeah, you're right. A lot of the time, like people who are on the outside looking in think that it's the photographers who are the highest risk situation to be around. But often no. if you're traveling, it is the act of traveling that is the most dangerous. 
Yeah, when I was just in L.A., I went from Oakland to Los Angeles. This was nobody's fault, but I almost died on a Greyhound because there was a severe weather warning. It was when L.A. had snow and it was flooding. And two of the highways were closed and there was snow falling down one of the mountains. Um, uh, it wasn't the 505. I forget what highway it was. But it was not made for a Greyhound bus. And I remember yeah. all of our phones were going off, like imminent danger, flood warning, do not travel, stay inside. And then this lady gets on the radio to the Greyhound driver and is like, incoming snow, go faster. And <laughs> we can see snow starting to come down the mountain. And I'm like, oh my God, we're going to die. We're going to die. We're all going to die. This dude is like, everybody on the ground. No, he went a hundred or more in that Greyhound bus. <gasps> what? Like, he had to. The snow was coming. That's crazy. Oh, my God. No, that was in LA, you said? It was on the way from Oakland to LA. Okay, so, yeah. I've actually, I've approached that mountain because there's a mountain that you approach before you get to town, if I recall. And, and even if it's raining, there's, like, weather warnings and... I, I partially blame the other drivers in Southern California for not being able to drive in that kind of weather. But I think a lot of it is that there's a buildup of like, you know, slick oil when it's dry that it doesn't wash away until it occasionally rains and then it's super slippery. But then in the snow, uh, it's even more dangerous because they, they, they don't get snow very often. They don't have a system for, for cleaning up the roads and making them safer. It wasn't even raining that hard. I'm from Florida. Yeah. <laughs> it it rains really so is. hard here. And like, I mean, like I have been picked up by a friend from the Orlando airport driving through like five inches of rain with actual flood warnings. And we're just going, we're all going 70 on the highway. Like, let's get out of the water. You know what I mean? They're going like 20 miles an hour on the highway. Yeah. Whoa. <laughs> I'm like, this is how you cause accidents. Yeah. People just, they don't know what to do when it rains down there because they're just not as used to it. That They're used to nice, sunny weather. <laughs> yeah, I know. It was so crazy. The bad weather kept fo following me. So it was like, I had a decent time in Oakland. I came in right after like the snow and the rain, but then it started raining the day I left. And then there was snow in LA. There was snow in Phoenix. And wow. then... I went from, when I was just in Chicago, I went from Chicago to Freeport to Madison, Wisconsin, and I got out literally like eight hours before the snowstorm hit. Damn. Your your method of touring right now, are you constantly on the road or do you go back to your home for like a few like weeks, days, or months and then go back out again? Like what what's your pattern of traveling? So for me personally, through trial and error, I used to do long two-week to one-month long tours. And what I found is more bad things happen when you do it that way and you actually end up losing money. What I found mm -hmm. the way that works best for me, three days per location, usually about a week to 10 day tour at a time. And then I'll do that, come home for a week and then go back out. Okay, yeah, that, that's intense, um, but it sounds like it's more effective. It's much more effective and cost-efficient that way. Um, and that yeah. way I can come home, take care of my cat, do laundry, actually be in the house I'm paying for. Yeah, totally. <laughs> so you're home for about a week, and then you go back out again? Yeah, usually I stay home for about a week, week and a half. Wow, that's intense. <laughs> oh, it's not half as intense as what I used to do. Yeah, oh with the God. longer tours, I'm I'm guessing, yeah. Yeah, not sure that. And so how long have you been uh, touring um, where you stay at home for a week to a week and a half and then go out again? How long have you had that pattern? I started doing that in 2020. So during the pandemic, were, were you able to travel around that time? In the middle of the pandemic is when I went from Florida all the way to Arizona and back. Oh, all right. <laughs> wow. Yeah, those were crazy times. <laughs> I was actually on tour the day the pandemic started. Oh, and my I God. To, I had to go home. March of 2020? Yep. 
Yeah. Well, I uh, think it was very early April. Very early April. Yeah, that was a uh, gosh. Oh my god, I remember then. It was. I was like, I was in denial. I was like, oh, this will be over in a couple of weeks. <laughs> a couple of weeks goes by, and then you know, extension of the quarantine, and more and more extensions of quarantine. God. Yeah. <laughs> well, so I was going to go to San Francisco and then Seattle, and none of my shoots canceled. They all were going to go through with everything. But when I was looking at Seattle, they're like, you can fly in, but you can't fly out. The only, and no buses. The only way you can leave is by car. Oh. And I was like, how, how am I going to get home? I yeah. was just like, and I was talking with my friend Andy. I was like, if I get stuck there, will you drive and come get me? And I, it just came to the point where I was like, I need to go home. Yeah. <laughs> I, God. Yeah, Seattle was one of the first cities besides New York that had like a an outbreak in a old folks home, like in mm-hmm. it was actually in Kirkland, right across the lake from Seattle. But then they had tons of uh, people getting COVID, and they were trying to stop people from traveling and make them stay at home and stuff. And obviously, like it spread like crazy. I'm originally from Seattle, so that's that would be what I call my hometown. Yeah, I remember that. I think I remembered messaging you saying if we can meet up, and then all every time I try to go to Seattle, it gets canceled. Oh, well, every I'll be time. there this summer if you happen to be there. <laughs> I'll try again. Also, I like to offer having shooting location available, and it's just so expensive there. It's more than the day. Yeah. Uh, A little secret about Seattle. I guess it's not a secret, but um, because it's usually gloomy and cold for most of the year, the summertime, especially early summer, but when it starts getting sunny again, like the people in Seattle like start coming out of their like dark, Mm -hmm. depressed hole. And then they suddenly, oh, I want to do that waterfall shoot that I've been dreaming about all, you know, since October because they can't really yeah. do very many outdoor shoots because it's cold and rainy. Um, so yeah, early summertime, it's a, it's a good time to try and go there. Maybe I'll try again and see if this time sticks. Yeah. And do, do outdoor shoots. Don't, don't yeah. screw around with the studios and the Airbnbs and stuff because people are cheap. They don't want to book a studio anymore. <laughs> why, why do you think I get Airbnbs? Yeah. I, that's, that's an extra expense for you. Well, if I don't have hosting, I have to sleep somewhere. Right. Yeah. And the most ideal, in my opinion, is to be hosted by fellow models because some photographers can be weird. <laughs> I have a decent host network. I don't have anybody in Seattle, but yeah, I, I have a decent host network. I, I find that I usually have to go somewhere at least two times to find hosting, which yeah. makes sense. They don't want to bring randos into their house, and I get that. Yeah, a lot of people in Seattle have either stopped hosting or moved away, though, so it's kind of hard in that city in particular. That I don't know really who hosts out there anymore, except I can't people find who are blacklisted. Anybody. Yeah, yeah, I mean, what I was thinking of, if I'm just doing outdoor shoots and stuff, I'll just get some crummy hotel or a shared room in someone's house. Just anything yeah. so that I have somewhere to put my head down at night. Word. Do you foresee yourself doing the touring modeling for like an extended period of years? Yeah, I'm probably going to go until I'm 30 and then I'm going to retire. Well, when you retire, like why, why 30? Because it'll have been, what, almost 15 years at that point Yeah. of modeling, and I'm exhausted already. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, so, like, you know, 30, I think, is a good mark because I can cross over to something else, and I'm still young. I can still go do other stuff, but I can't keep touring full-time after that. It's going to be too much. That's cool. And and you've been freelancing for so long that you already have like the experience, will and desire to continue coming up with your own projects or do you think that you want to get hired somewhere? Well, it's a mixed bag. I haven't stuck. so my main my dream goal is to build or even buy a house with a small amount of land on it somewhere and then build 
an attachment or even a detached house, small house in the background that is a fully functioning studio that I can host models at and do workshops and also do daily breaks. Basically, I've got a plan to make it so it would be fully functioning and self-sufficient. I'm not even near that. Things are so expensive now, i got to figure out where I would do that. I've basically got all of the photography equipment I need. I just need the land. That's really cool. I Well, I believe that you can do that. You know, you'll, you'll find a place. I think that's awesome. Thank you. Either that or I'm going to go and try and do some type of IT development. And here's another question that I have for you that I ask everybody on the podcast. Uh, I like to call it the rising phoenix era of your life. Can you describe a part of your life, whether it's related to your modeling or not, where you were faced with a challenge that you had to overcome? Yeah, so this actually wasn't that long ago. So I was previously in a relationship for eight years, about two years ago, and it did not end well, and it was both of our faults, and we had a house together. We didn't own it. We were renting it. I had my two cats. While this was happening, one of my cats died. She was 13, and I essentially became homeless. He kicked me out, and I was homeless, and I had nowhere to go. I was screwed. I had no money. It was during the pandemic. I had no work. Couldn't get any work. I had to move all of my belongings into a storage unit. And by the grace of God, Bob Robichaud over here helped me live out of an extended stay for about two weeks. Then I got a job. I had to go all the way to Georgia for the training. I got a job as a manager at the Del Taco that was opening up in Florida. And, um, I had to go do full training up in Georgia, had to get a room for rent for my cat while I was gone and came back after two weeks, had to open up the Del Taco, teach all of the staff, train all of them. I was working, I don't know, 12 to 14 hour days, six days a week. I was not getting paid enough. I had no other option. I got an apartment. It was a hood ass apartment, but it was an apartment. Got an apartment, moved the cat in, had a job. I stayed at the Del Taco for probably about three months, and then I quit. And I started touring again. But getting myself out of that hole was hell. Fast food is hardcore. I was my first job was fast food. Man. (laughs) I I wouldn't wish it. I, I was at a call center for four years, and I was like, I'm sorry, call center. I'm so sorry. Would you say the call center or, or the fast food was worse? Fast food, 100%. Oh, really? I've always thought that working at a call center would suck. Oh, it does <laughs> suck. But I was the manager. So not. So this is what I, I was cleaning the dishes, running the front counter, taking orders, doing drive through cooking the food, teaching my staff. And they would force me to stay until like 4 in the morning. And then I would have to come back to open at 10. Oh, uh... And, and, the worst, and the worst thing, in, in my opinion, about fast food is that if if you're the manager, that when you have a pissed off customer, they talk to the manager. They, if you're oh, an employee yeah. just working the cash register, you're like, oh, are you pissed off? Okay, let you pass you off to my manager. And the other employees can just pass them off to you. So you had to deal with that. <laughs> Well, I'm actually really good at dealing with difficult customers. And I always oh. like, so if they would be mad at me, I would just be like, I strongly apologize for the inconvenience, man. I'll be more than happy to assist this, assist you with this today. I need you to calm down and see if we can fix the problem. And then usually if you talk really fast with big words, people get confused and they just shut up. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. I do not miss that. But props oh, for you I for being able to pull through during the pandemic worst three months of my life never again (laughs) that is that is seriously hardcore you've had to come out of some seriously hardcore life situations props to you thank you i appreciate (laughs) I've, i've learned a lot about your i didn't really hardly know anything about you except that we're on that uh group chat on instagram and you know i've i've seen your page and we've chatted a little bit here and there but it's really interesting learning more about you 
Thank you. Yeah, I've been following your journey for a long time, and you're a lot more forthright on the internet with stuff than I am. I kind of only push business on there. Yeah, but. I think it's because I'm jaded. <laughs> you're jaded. <laughs> I'm a bit jaded and I make more, most of my income comes from my own efforts now. I don't have to rely on photographers to hire me so I can like post shit and like make fun of like the creepy people because I'm not well, relying on a lot of people to hire me anymore. I was just saying that exact thing. I was, cause I was talking with my friend Nikki about what I was going to say on here and I was like, I'm not going to say that cause she doesn't need the booking still, but I do. Oh, yeah, totally. <laughs> but um, no, probably like when I am like retiring, I'll do the same thing. Cool. At that point, it doesn't matter. Yeah. And have have you ever um, considered starting like a Patreon or Fansly or OnlyFans or anything like that? I have an OnlyFans account, but it's not well, as successful as some of these other girls. They make a lot. Yeah, it, it's a lot more work than a lot of people might realize. <laughs> It's a ton of work. Right. The easiest way I've found is that I sit down for like one to two days and schedule. The people who are the most successful on there are on there every day, like interacting like on OnlyFans. If that little green light that shows that you're active and online is on more frequently, I think you, you're you in my experience, like when I have been like sitting on my computer with that open, I, it seems that I'm doing more well on there. But even if I schedule content to come out every day, if I'm not like active and I'm not shown like online, I, I people just leave my page. So it is hard. Huh. Yeah. I mean, props on you. I used to be like that, but my brain has just gotten to the point where I can't do it anymore. It, it, it yeah. comes to a point where I'm like, is the money worth it? Yeah. I, I, the traveling modeling is hard too, though. The the running from city to city and, you know, having your, if your Airbnb falls through, it can kind of throw a wrench in your whole tour. So like all that is also hard, but I guess you have to choose your hard. You have to choose what challenges you're willing to like undergo and like which one is more worth the income that you're going to be making, I guess. Yeah, it's all just personal preference, you know, like, and no shame on what anybody ever wants to do. You know what I mean? Totally. It's, it's all just personal preference of what you want to do. Um, I also have a really good support network. I've made friends with some photographers who have saved my life, literally. That's um, awesome. Bob Robichaud, Andy Wang, um, they are my best friends. Uh, John W., they have been there for me. And like, if I'm ever in a really bad position and I have no way out, I can call them and they'll help me. Bob Robichaud, I, I remember him. Did he recently pass? Yeah, unfortunately, he passed on July 2nd of last year. Hmm. Yeah, he was really nice. I used to work with him when I went to town. I always remember him being really nice and reliable. Yeah, he he is one of the good guys for sure. He fixed my teeth. Fix your teeth? Yeah, my teeth are rotting. Oh my and gosh. He helped me get six crowns in the front. Wow, that's amazing. What a guy. Yeah, he's he's a really, really good guy. Rest in peace. Yep, rest in peace, Bob. I went to the beach after he died and I poured out a bottle of tequila for him. <laughs> one one for the homies <laughs> one for the homies and then we lit off a bunch of fireworks that that group that he uh photographs at often uh dan richards's group is po- probably one of the only male photographer run group shoot type places that i'll ever do again because i feel like dan richards and his group of people are more or less like nice and not predatory <laughs> Yeah, Dan's got some good people that come through. A lot of the traveling girls go to him. Shout out to Dan Richards. <laughs> I, I don't know if I'll be going. I hope so too. I don't know if I'll be going back to Dallas as much as I used to. I don't know if I can stomach it. I haven't been back since he died. I was actually in the hospital room with him right before I came back oh. to Dallas. I was with him in Dallas in the hospital room. And wow. um when I got home, I think it, he had to go back to the hospital. What actually, what happened was we used to talk to each other every single day. We were best friends. I mean, we traveled the entire country together. He's come to my house multiple times. 
I've gone to his house a bunch. Um, and he wasn't responding. And I was like, something's wrong. I had to call the police from Florida to break his door down. <gasps> and he was face down on the ground. <gasps> and they brought him to the hospital. He had had uh, temporary onset dementia from a kidney infection that he had. Um, and then he had a hernia and they did surgery. Um, but I don't know, maybe there was an infection or something. Because when I left, he was in the rehab center and he had gone home. I arranged for him to go home and he was fine. Had a cleaning crew come through and everything. And then a week later, he was dead. Oh, no. He wasn't that old. He was 72. 72. He was in bad health, though. He was in bad health. Oh, that sucks. Poor guy. Yeah, but I mean... I don't think he was in too much pain. I think he went fairly peacefully, hopefully. Yeah. Wow. Some people make close bonds with the people that they work with, and it's not, like, weird or anything. There's definitely photographers that I've become close friends with that I'm like, you know, it's cool when you get to spend time, but you're traveling all the time, so. I came from, like, a turbulent household. He was, like, my replacement grandpa. <laughs> and, um, we went to Vegas together. Oh my god, the looks we got. He's on his mobility scooter, and I'm sitting in the basket. And <laughs> he's smoking a joint, and I have a 40. <laughs> yes. And we were going down the strip, and the looks we got. It was the best time of his life, I'm sure, though. We had a great time. <laughs> Love Vegas for the people watching, mostly. If I saw that, I'd get a kick out of it, too. Yeah, Vegas is fun for vacation. For work, it's not too great. Yeah, it's real hit or miss in my experience. I've spent a deal of time there in the last few years, and it seems that the people who live there that pay are extremely rare and, like, always booked out. And then, other than that, there's people who are coming to Vegas for like a convention that might want to hire a model for a couple of hours before or after the convention. So yeah, it's, it's a bit tough. Yeah. I've never made more than 1500 bucks in Vegas, but usually what I do when I go there is um, I do it while I'm on tour going to somewhere else. I'll never just go there. Cool. Well, we're getting close to um, the length of time that my podcasts usually go. Uh, is there anything else that you wanted to mention before the podcast ends? Uh, no, not exactly. Uh, if anybody ever has any questions or you guys are interested in working together, feel free to reach out. You can find me on Instagram at Miss underscore Taylor White and Facebook as well at Taylor White Model. My website is www.taylorwhitemodel.com. And I try to be prompt in response. Any questions you have, I'll be happy to answer. Awesome. I'll include all those links in the description of the podcast episode, too, so that people can click on it. Awesome. Thank you. Well, thanks so much for having the podcast with me today, Taylor. It was really great getting to know you, and and I hope to, to see you this summer. I hope so, too. Thank you so much.